In today's video, we're taking a look at the latest NHL trade rumors. We're talking about teams like the Toronto Maple Leafs, the Winnipeg Jets, who might be the next captain of the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, we also have word on another PTO, some more PWHL signings, an NHL Hall of Famers getting his number retired this year, and a whole lot more coming up next. Well, welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we have a variety of NHL things and news and rumors to talk about today. Uh, let's get things started first with uh, an update today uh, coming from a variety of NHL reporters that the NHL is actually holding meetings today. Uh, and actually, it seems like it's the first time they've done this, but it's uh, kind of special meetings. It almost seems like it's more of a workshop style meeting or event for all 32 NHL general managers and head coaches. Uh, I believe his is kind of like... A workshop sort of event, like I said, to kind of discuss a variety of different things, including different types of behaviors, uh, you know, how coaches treat officials, how players are handled, all those types of different things. I'm sure there's other league business probably being discussed as well. Um, but, you know, all those sort of things. Apparently they had uh, Stan Bowman and Joel Quenville, of course, both former Chicago Blackhawks GM and coach at the event. Both guys right now would like to get back into the NHL, but are currently barred from doing so until they get league approval from Gary Bettman. Uh, and they both spoke, and it's believed that they wouldn't speak to the media to confirm anything, but based on what reporters heard, is essentially they talked a lot about the Kyle Beach situation and basically gave their thoughts and opinions based on their experience on how to and how not to handle various types of situations so probably kind of talking about things they should have done differently what they've learned and all that type of stuff so i'm assuming this is probably you know they said they were, according to the league they were there at their own discretion there they were not like you know made to do that or anything like that but uh something that they're probably you know trying to show the league that they're uh, taking steps to hopefully you know learn from what happened and to you know, make sure that they're in a position to make sure nothing like that happens again. Uh, Gary Bettman did seem to say as well that um, I think he's going to be looking a little closer at their potential reinstatement in the not too distant future. So uh, I think it's a good idea to have those types of meetings. And obviously, lots of things can be learned and shared, best practices, and all that type of stuff. Not just for man, because there's lots of manager meetings for like league business, but you don't often get all the different coaches and stuff in there as well. So that's certainly. Uh, you know, a good idea, and I hope it's something that they continue to do. Uh, Pierre LeBrun's reporting today that it's not official yet, but looking like uh, Friday, March the 8th, is going to be the NHL trade deadline. Uh, so that should be confirmed likely in the near future. Uh, we also got word as of last night that was announced, but the word broke more today, that the Blackhawks are retiring. Chris Chelios' number seven will be raised to the Raptors later this season. It's going to be raised on February the 25th when Chicago plays Detroit, which is very fitting, considering the, uh, the you know the, the time that Chelios played in the NHL. Of course, he uh, started with the Montreal Canadiens, uh, had good success there, but obviously uh, played a long time for the Blackhawks and the Red Wings. So nice to see that um, you know they're going to be in town for that as well. Uh, the Blackhawks apparently have kind of made some changes, according to some local reporters, on their criteria uh, that they kind of put forth to decide whether or not to retire numbers, which leads some to believe that we may see more of this. Uh, the Blackhawks were one of those teams that just really didn't do like it, it was, they were very selective and very picking who they retired, which I think they should be to some degree, but they have a ton of deserving players that have not even really been considered on, until now. Um, also another player to think about when you think of the number seven is Brent Seabrook. I mean, obviously he was a big part of their more recent cup championships and, you know, he was a huge part of that. And some think that uh, even though Chelios' number seven is retired, that it's still possible they could retire Seabrook's number seven as well and also raise it to the rafters. Obviously, if a player like Chelios or some of these other legends, um, you know, didn't have their numbers raised and somebody else has worn it, then and it justified it as well, then they can retire a number more than one occasion for more than one player. So um, I know Brent Seabrook's a player they'll likely consider uh, based on all the different criteria. I know they have to be like, well, all of it's going to be dependent. Like, for example, I believe you have to be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, I think you have to have won a Stanley Cup, played a thousand games, things like that. So, obviously, some of the younger guys that are, you know, I guess they're not really younger 
per se compared to the like current NHL players. But when you're looking at like Kane and Taves and Keith and Seabrook and that latest crop that had all that success, you know, in the last 10, 15 years, um, once they're, they have to be retired at least three years and meet the other criteria. So it doesn't mean they all get there. Seabrook may not reach that requirement, but if he does and they want to consider it, it's not a big deal that Chelios is going to be, uh, have his same number up in the rafters. Apparently what happened is there was a Pearl Jam concert last night in Chicago and they had Chris Chelios on stage and uh, they, the band was able to uh, announce this and show him a video up on the Jumbotron uh, to make the announcement that this was going to happen. So, I mean, that's a pretty cool way to let him know. Uh, obviously, Chelios is a legend of the game, had tons of success, and certainly uh, absolutely deserves to have his number raised to the rafters. It's one of the few things that he didn't have yet uh, checked off his career. I mean, he's in the Hall of Fame. He's he's won just about everything else. So, good on Chicago to, to move forward. Apparently, this was also one of Rocky Wirtz's uh, last wishes before he passed away. Uh, some more news today from the PWHL, the Professional Women's League. More signings this time for the final team that we hadn't heard from yet. That's the New York franchise. Uh, their th- first three signings that they're allowed to do here is going to be Abby Rock, Alex Carpenter, and Micah Zandy Hart. So those are their three selections. I'll get three-year contracts. Obviously, the next time we'll hear of players being added to these rosters will be when they hold their draft on September the 18th. I believe the draft's being held in Toronto, uh, and they are going to have as many as about 50 players or so in person live for the draft as well. Um, and then the rest, obviously, will obviously be being notified elsewhere or other ways electronically. But um, ultimately, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see now some of the rest of the moves and let me know the first three players for each franchise and how these things kind of get filled out uh the colorado avalanche have another player coming to camp on a pto and that's saku mendelainen so he'll be there as well to uh can try to compete for a contract and potential roster spot um we also got word from elliot freeman there's the latest another like 32 thoughts podcast that came out today uh freeman and merrick talked about a variety of things a bunch of news uh one of the things they talked about was shane wright and the seattle kraken we had talked before that the kraken were working trying to get an exception with the chl that if shane wright wasn't um on the uh, opening roster for the kraken if he doesn't make the team at a camp that instead of sending him back to junior uh, that they could send him to the american hockey league he was only one game played away from having his eligibility happen automatically anyways to go to the ahl because he where he was an exceptional status uh, player uh, he did get enough time in the ohl but because of the pandemic and the lack of games uh, he's one game played shy of what is normally required to be able to move on to the AHL at his age. Normally, he had to be a year older. But uh, only being one game play shy, Friedman says he believes that the Kraken already have the exception. He doesn't expect anything to be formally announced because we don't know where Shane Wright for sure is going to play. We know he's worked hard this summer, and he's going to do his best to make the team in a training camp. But after training camp, and they've made their roster decisions, if they want to be able to send him to the AHL, he believes they're going to be able to do that. So that's going to be good for his development as well. If he, I don't think there's really much for him left to accomplish in junior. I think some time in the AHL will probably do him a world of good before uh, maybe getting him um, more of a taste of the NHL possibly as early as next year. Now another player that is going to be looking for a big extension, uh, like we just uh, saw with Jake Sanderson and the Senators, is Rasmus Dahlin in the Buffalo Sabres organization. Of course, Dahlin's a little bit older than Sanderson. Uh, obviously on his next contract, already on the second contract already. Um, so this will be his first long-term one. It's believed that he's looking for something in the $10.5 million range. Uh, on an eight-year contract extension. Um, I mean, Friedman cited his uh, Sabres sources um, saying that that's believed to be the number, and it's kind of continuously gone up. It was believed it was going to be around $10 million when they had heard earlier in the offseason, but that's kind of where things are at. Some people think that it's already agreed to and that they're going to wait and announce it during training camp or an opening night or something just to make a big hoopla out of it in Buffalo. I don't know. You know, they kind of debate it whether or not that was really necessary, but at the end of the day, um, you know, he's a big part of the Sabres. There's no doubt he's, you know, well in line for a big extension. We know that for sure is coming. The exact number is hard to say, but it sounds like it's going to be over $10 million. So we'll have to wait and see that. It obviously will have a big impact 
on their salary cap moving forward. Uh, another thing to watch for as well, we know the Vancouver Canucks are are most likely naming a new captain this year. And according to Elliot Friedman, he believes the front runner that most are saying that expect to happen would be Quinn Hughes. There was a lot of belief it might be Pedersen, but it sounds like Quinn Hughes is going to most likely be given a designation. So obviously uh, Pedersen likely gets an A out of this. Obviously they're both a huge part of the team's leadership and both part of the future as well. I know Pedersen's getting a lot of attention because he's eligible for a contract extension right now. I mean, he is an RFA after the season. It made it clear to uh, Sportsnet and Elliot Freeman and Jeff Merrick when he did the, uh, the European interview a few weeks ago that he's in absolutely no rush to get this contract done. I think he's quite content to sit back, see how the season goes, see the direction of the team before making a firm decision on exactly you know, how long he wants to sign for, what kind of term he's looking at, does he want to stay in, mean, just to kind of iron all that out. So uh, Quinn Hughes, you know, from what we've heard, is certainly um, you know does a lot of things off the ice to earn a lot of respect for the other teammates. So sounds like he would make a good candidate uh, for the C. So we'll see what the Canucks do when they make an announcement. But Friedman believes that Hughes is going to end up being their guy. Uh, a few other things that Friedman talked about, they talked about a lot of the updates on various you know, trade talk that's been around for some time, including the Winnipeg Jets. One thing he said that was a bit surprising is he said at this point, he says it's not impossible that Connor Hullabuck actually ends up staying with the Winnipeg Jets. He said that his uh, belief is that once Hullabuck arrives in Winnipeg uh, ahead of training camp, that he's going to sit down and have a conversation with Kevin Dayoff and that the uh, the two are going to talk, and he thinks it's quite possible that maybe, just maybe, they do work out uh, a plan for him to stay, that maybe after having a few months to decompress and think about everything, that maybe they'll have a change of heart. Now, of course, we know that there was lots of rumors and speculation that uh, Winnipeg had discussions about possibly trading him, but teams did not want to come close to his new contract demands. And, you know, that could play a big role in his decision here. Obviously, uh, one thing that they were told as well between Friedman and Merrick sources, they said that some of the, actually it was Friedman, so a former player that played in Winnipeg told them that uh, they feel like the players there would like to know more and have better communication from management around the plans and direction of the team that they find that they're kept in the dark a lot and they don't always know what's going on and kind of what the plan is to make the team better and what the vision for the team is and that they would if they can make that better and be more open with some of these guys especially their top you know players and veterans then it might go a long way to helping them understand where things are at you know what the the future is then Winnipeg what are their plans and it might help them want to stay obviously he said like you know Hellebuck's an all-star goaltender but at the same time even though it was believed before he wouldn't sign an extension you know after getting a chance to kind of get away from things and you know have a few months to think it over I think the Jets are at least hopeful and optimistic that he'll have a change of heart and that maybe they can work out something for him to stay i mean at the end of the day here yes they're gonna they definitely went through some changes this year with the dubois trade i think they got a pretty good return on that and we know that um you know they still have a lot of good pieces there um you know obviously if Hellbuck and Shifley are both moved, and depending on what they get back for returns, like you know, they may not be so good anymore. It's hard to say, but you know, obviously Wheeler ended up leaving, Dubois left, uh, but Shifley and Hellbuck remain. He said, when it comes to Shifley, you know, clearly the Jets were optimistic for quite a while there that they were going to have Dubois and Shifley be their two top six centers for a long time, and unfortunately that hasn't worked out. It with Dubois gone, that. Um, the belief is is that if Winnipeg wants to entertain trading Shifley, that they absolutely need a centerman back. And if they're not able to really get that, then that's why they're kind of holding off and, and maybe considering trying to work something out with him too. I mean, it's not a given that they get traded anymore. I think we can all say that it's pretty safe to say based on the fact that it, they went all season and never happened. But at the same time, usually you see the things kind of slow down in August. But then they often pick back up, you know, around early mid September, when we're getting, you know, a week or two away from training camp, and a lot of teams start to get a little bit busier. And he said that's what he's been told, as well as at the trade talk, and conversations are picking up a lot now that everybody's kind of getting back in town. There's more meetings. It's you know we're not into the season yet, but we're kind of, you know, at that point where. We're pretty much there. So teams are starting to get back to work. So we should see more activity and kind of get an idea on where 
things might be heading. But based on right now, from what he's had to say, it certainly sounds like at least it's a decent possibility that Hollenbach and Shifley maybe both stay. But we'll see what they work out. Uh, in Toronto, there's a Toronto Sun article from Terry Koshan uh, talking about how he believes that the Leafs really... Um, you know, the one thing that they have left to do that he thinks Trey Living is working on is improving the blue line. Now, to do much of anything, they do need to shed money. I mean, they, they probably need to shed money regardless here because, you know, moving players to waivers or to the minors if they're eligible uh, to get cap compliant. Many people believe Cali Yarncroak will be the odd man out that they end up eventually moving. I mean, I know some people argue he had such a good season last year, scored 20 goals. But to be honest, I think with the role he did with the strong players he played with, I think he could be replaceable and they could get that same production for less money. So I wouldn't completely rule out a yarn croak deal in order to free up some space here, which could be involved to find another defenseman. Certainly their decor is it's not bad, I mean, but there's fair to say that they could, you know, if they can make it work to bring in another solid top four guy would be Certainly something they'd really very much entertain. We know Brad Tree Living, as long as he's been a GM, he has a history of building from the blue line out. So I think it's fair to say that with everything else they've done, that that's certainly their main focus for sure. Um, now we'll see what happens as well with William Nylander. I know Chris Johnson had a new podcast out today as well, talking about the latest on the Leafs and talked a lot about uh, Nylander. And obviously the big thing with the Matthews extension was that Matthews didn't want it to drag into the season. He didn't want it to be a distraction. He wanted to get it done uh, and so he can move forward with the, the season and not have it be a discussion point and, like I said, a, a big distraction. Now, William Nylander, on the other hand, seems like he really doesn't care on that front. Like, he's in no rush whatsoever. Absolutely no rush. And uh, CJ said that essentially the Leafs um, – Probably didn't have a, a lot of conversations in the last probably month, but now that we're into September, he believes Pride Tree Living is going to make another solid attempt at getting Nylander signed before the season starts. If he cancels it, hopefully they can remove that distraction. Um, like he said when the comments when he signed Matthews was that, you know, Matthews decided that he wanted this to get done, so they hammered it out, and they got it done. He didn't want it to be a distraction for his team. He wanted to have, you know, it looked after and done with. So there was no doubt he was staying. They knew exactly what he was signed to. And we could all stop talking about it. Where Nylander seems to have a very different approach. Like, you know, he doesn't have a care in the world. And he just wants what he wants. And it's just that simple. And as CJ said, there's still strong belief that he doesn't feel like there's that big of a gap between himself and Matthews or Marner and that he's going to be looking for big money. There's just no doubt about it. Uh, now, whether or not the Leafs feel like they can move him or not is a whole other story. Like They're kind of in an awkward situation here. Like I said, I don't think they really want to subtract. And it's, certainly it's important to win this year, so you don't want to lose the guy unless you can get back somebody who can give you similar production. But at the same time, that's going to be proved to be very difficult to do. And I don't know that they can really get a deal done one way or another and, you know, without taking some steps back. And that's the issue here with Nylander, right? Like, you know, if you have to trade him, are you going to get anything back that's going to help you right now? Like maybe, but a possibility you take a step back. So you certainly don't want that, but you don't want to, you know, not take care of it and have him walk for nothing in the offseason too. So even though the urgency was there from Matthews, it's still not there from uh, Nylander. And like I said, as CJ says, that uh, Trey Living and company will take another attempt at this here before the season starts. And then we'll see where it goes. They don't really want the distraction. If he's in no hurry and the offer is not what he wants it to be, he can take his good old time and, like I said, just kind of drag it out and see where it goes. And if he ends up leaving next year, he leaves next year. We'll just have to see where that goes. But right now, things are not looking good for a Nylander extension. But let me know your thoughts on all today's news and rumors down in the comments. We'll discuss further. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with the latest news, rumors, and analysis of all 32 NHL teams. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time.